evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you may be. Welcome to London. I'm Jeff Cox and this is Jeff Talk. He's an internationally celebrated, award-winning couture designer who has dressed royalty, celebrities and glitterati and his work has been seen at the most prestigious events. From humble beginnings to the bright lights of London and a successful fashion label, in 2008 he was the first Pakistani to showcase at London Fashion Week and has since produced 15 collections and been published across the globe. His Wikipedia entry credits him with having reintroduced fusion to the fashion scene and is he possibly one of the most eligible bachelors in London? Please welcome Omar Mansour. Omar Mansour, welcome to Jeff York. Hello, Mr. How are you, sir? Thank you very, very much. Very good. Ramadan Mabarak. Oh, thank you. You can, Mubarak. Lockdown. How have you been uh, getting on? What have you been up to? It's a tough time for everyone, isn't it? It is indeed. It's more of an interesting time as compared to tough times, we should say. And uh, I'm actually enjoying the change in the lifestyle, which was never predicted before. And uh, any bad habits you've picked up since you've been off? Uh, three and a half kilos of weight. <laughs> oh dear. Yes, we've, we, I think we've all done that. <laughs> True. <laughs> Let's, uh, let's talk about when you first arrived here in the UK um, mm -hmm. as a bright-eyed young boy uh, with uh, big ideas of wanting to get into the fashion industry. What was the, uh, the toughest part of that transition? I think the toughest part of the transition was will I be able to make it with my signature style? Because I was not much confident about the signature style of embroidering and embellishing the garments to that level will actually be uh, uh, accepted by the market and appreciated by the client. And uh, what about the actual transition personally from Pakistan to London life? Oh yeah, obviously, um, I think it was sort of this one thing, I mean, starting from how to wash your own clothes and how to buy the washing powder from the supermarket and there's bio, non bio color, non color, this kind of <laughs> variety. <laughs> So something which I still don't do is to make my own food, to buy your own food. Uh, and uh, yeah, I have to go through a lot of learning actually. It was a very good learning process for me, understanding how to get along uh, with different cultures, people from different ethnic backgrounds. So there was a lot of learning in that case. And uh, did you have family here or connections already? No, not at all. I think I'm the only Pakistani who doesn't have any connections here in London. <laughs> okay. So let's talk about your family history and, and coming from Pakistan, because you have a, a fascinating family history. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, my great-grandfather was in the United India under the British Raj, and it was not divided as Pakistan and India and Bangladesh. Well, the East Pakistan in those days. So we were in the India part of the India. Uh, and after 1947, when the partition took place, so we had to migrate my great great grandfather towards the and my grandfather towards the Pakistan side, and they came with nothing <laughs> because they were looted in the middle and because of the all chaos exactly. So then they restarted their uh, textile business which they were into because my great grandfather was into making the rugs in those days. Carpets were a great, big luxury because we don't have machine made carpets, it were handmade carpets and handmade rugs. So he used to get the handmade rugs made by his fellows and labor and sell them in the market. So when my great grandfather migrated here and my grandfather had left nothing, he started uh, selling the same rugs on the back of his bicycle. <laughs> And then it took on and on. My father was born and lucky. <laughs> and was that something that uh, inspired you and motivated you to want to go into the, uh, a career that involved textiles or manufacturing, etc., etc.? Yeah, uh, 
when my father came into the world and my grandfather switched from the rugs business to the textile business and he started selling fabric and clothes because he moved to the manchester the city of uh, sister city of manchester uh, sorry twin city of manchester faisalabad so that's the textile town of pakistan and in that era manchester was a textile town of britain so that's what they were titled as twin cities uh, so yeah my grandfather came into textiles so my father came into spinning he was making thread and all my uncles and relatives were into textiles living in a textile town so yeah. for me yeah. it was yeah. a hobby and it's something which i used to go to visiting a textile mill after my school time was something even my school trips uh, the uh, what we call recreational trips we used to go to the bigger textile groups and mills and we used to just see how the thread is made how the cotton is picked up in the fields and how fabric is developed and then how it's printed and how it's converted to garment and then it's exported to the west and other countries so and was there any particular moment that you remember or you recall where you suddenly thought this is what i want to do as a, as young as i go to class eight years old i think uh, i remember that i knew that i would be definitely making prints for textiles because i was really good into my arts in those days in my school and not in not very good in other subjects so whenever my headmistress used to tell me that why don't you study and work equally in the other subjects also so i said no because i'm not getting anything out of them i have to proceed my career into arts so she was like okay fine and what arts so i said well a textile mill is there in the family and i can work as a textile designer so that was the whole concept so you went to the london college of fashion you know, correct, and you, you studied there and graduated. When researching your work, um, I don't think I've ever seen so many magazine covers and articles attributed to one designer. So obviously your, your trail of success has been big. What were your feelings that, that first time you were published or that you did a, a large event? Oh my God, I think it was a surreal kind of concept. And it keeps keeps on coming back repeatedly over the years also because as soon as uh, I mean as many times as the events getting bigger and bigger, so when uh, I did my very first London Fashion Week, I was like, okay, I'm ready to get retired. I have achieved the self actualization stage of my life, so <laughs> that's done. And I've been featured on the biggest news channel which I wanted to be. So I think I have achieved whatever I thought in my life. But that was the very first step. And then I was asked by my elders, okay, what next? And then, yeah, it, there comes the Vogue, and then comes the BBC, and all those uh, media and press. So then I realized, okay, there are more galaxies ahead of this galaxy also, which we see every night. So <laughs> let's explore and, that. And, and these years down the line, when I when I did the introduction, I, I mentioned how many collections you'd had. Um, that uh, whether you were possibly one of the most eligible bachelors in London at the moment having the single life as you do and uh because i noticed in a magazine article that you once scored very highly as hottie of the week in a in a <laughs> press article that i saw how do you feel about that that must be quite flattering uh, well it was in way back in i think 2013 or 14 somewhere uh it was flattering. <laughs> <It wasn't laughs> <laughs> and um plans for the future then personally and professionally and, and what are your collection inspirations? Because I imagine they must change and develop season to season. Yes, they actually do. I do, I do uh, work on the trend forecasting a lot. So the first formula is 30-70. So 30% has to be creative, signature style, my style. The 70% has to be commercial. So this is how the collection is being uh, designed, roughly. And then we do trend forecasting, the color forecasting, and then comes my muse, which is usually a British muse uh, from the British history, a modern history of uh, Europe. So I merge the muse with my signature style, with the trend forecasting and the 3070 formula, and here comes out of, we churn out a collection out of that. So the whole idea is not just to people see and appreciate the collection, but actually to wear and enjoy repeatedly wearing the collection. So that's the whole concept. Okay, Omar, it's time to play our brand new quick fire game, which everybody is playing, all of our guests. 
is called I Can't Believe I Said That. 40 seconds to answer as many of these multiple choice questions as you can. The stop, top score so far is 10 by Lizzie Elliott. So uh, are you okay? Are you ready? Shall we start? Right. I'm ready, Let sir. I hope. <laughs> yes, I hope you did it. Let's go. City or countryside? Countryside. Coffee or tea? Tea. Cake or dessert? Cake. Mansion or penthouse? Penthouse. The last thing that you were late for? A meeting with a client. Housework you hate doing? Cleaning the floor. What was your best subject at school? Uh, arts. Describe your dance style in one word. Freestyle. <laughs> Night out or early riser? Night out. Well, that's, that's the end of it. So let's have a look. Nine. You scored nine. Oh. So that was very close. So you've gone pretty <laughs> close. I'd say that was quite good. I'd, I'd be quite impressed with that. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you, as, as always. Um, what advice would you give to a young struggling designer who maybe wants to step into your shoes one day where you are now? First of all, do understand that after this post pandemic era, which we will soon enter, uh, norms will be changed. So there will be new norms, which you guys will be uh, defining and come towards the sustainability of fashion. I mean, pre this pandemic, we were discussing who is fashion conscious. But now we'll be discussing conscious fashion. So people will be going for where it's coming from, how sustainable it is. People won't be talking much about or uh, this fast fashion, disposable fashion. I mean, uh, we are producing 1.4 billion uh, garments a year on the world for six, seven billion people. So the fast fashion trend will be definitely changing. So look for the product which is so sustainable, uh, which is ethically produced and which is uh, a classy project, uh, product in which people can invest with a long-term uh, vision. Omar Mansur, as always, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much, sir. My pleasure. That was Omar Mansur. I'm Jeff Cox. Join me next time for Jeff Talk. <laughs>